everyone, welcome. I'd like to begin with acknowledging with the deepest respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands, and the Esquimalt, Songhees, and Wasanish peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. I would also like to acknowledge that our lecture this evening is made possible through the generous support of the Orion Fund that is facilitated through the Office of the Dean of Fine Arts. Our guest this evening, alumni Charo Neville, is curator at the Kamloops Art Gallery, where she has developed a program of contemporary historical and touring exhibitions, along with publications since 2011. She graduated with a Master of Arts degree in Critical Curatorial Studies from the University of British Columbia in 2006. Neville has held positions as curatorial assistant at the Vancouver Art Gallery, associate director at Catri on the Jeffreys Gallery, and interim curator and director at ArtSpeak. Neville also served on the board of directors at the Western Front from 2006 to 2010. She has facilitated public art projects throughout Kamloops, including Luminosity, which she initiated in 2014. In addition to developing publications for the Kamloops Art Gallery since 2011, Neville has contributed to magazines, including Philip, Ishu, West Coast Line, and Black Flash, and participated on visual arts juries, including the 2013 Sobe Art Award. Please join me in welcoming Charo Neville. Hello, everyone. So many of you. Um, I'm going to be reading, so I'm just going to hold up my paper here. Um, thank you so much for joining me this evening. I'm speaking to you from my office at the Kamloops Art Gallery. All of this land, what we refer to as Kamloops and beyond, is Sequatmec Ulu the traditional and unceded territory of the Tecumloops Te Sequatm. As a settler, I acknowledge my privilege in being able to live, play, and work on these occupied territories. I'm incredibly grateful to Rick and the University of Victoria for this invitation to speak about my practice. As he mentioned, I'm an alumni of UVic. I completed my undergrad degree in art history uh, in the late 90s and my time at UVic gave me a fundamental foundation that I still draw on. Um, I'm much more accustomed to giving talks about artists' work and exhibitions, so this has given me a rare opportunity to reflect on my own practice as a curator, not something I do much. <laughs> uh, so part of this reflection has been about where I come from. Some background on me, I grew up on Hornby Island, not far from Victoria. Uh, Hornby is a Gulf island off of the northern end of, end of Vancouver Island. I grew up steeped in art within a family of artists and cultural experiences like the annual Hornby Island Festival, which brings internationally renowned performers to this tucked away island each summer. I was exposed to the work of professional dancers and musicians from around the world and well-known visual artists and curators living on Hornby, including the painter Jack Shadbolt, along with his wife, curator Dora Shadbolt, artist Tom Burroughs, Jerry Pethick, uh, Wayne Gann, and curators Annette Hertig and Scott Watson. It was Annette who encouraged me to apply for UBC's critical curatorial graduate program uh, started by Scott. I also credit Annette with giving me the opportunity as a guest curator at the Kamloops Art Gallery in 2011, where she was curator, uh, where I worked on two solo exhibitions and publications, uh, Esther Shalev Gertz and Jermaine Coe, projects that she had begun but couldn't see through due to health reasons. She then encouraged me to apply for the full-time curator position at the CAG, and that's CAG with a K, not a C, um, when she left, and that decision was almost 10 years ago now, so it obviously had a huge impact on my career. Um, I mention all of this because for those of you who are students, I can't stress enough how important these kind of mentors and supporters are in developing your practice. I've had many people like Annette who have mentored me and offered me opportunities along the way. I've also come to realize that my work at the Kamloops Art Gallery has been shaped by this deep understanding of how valuable cultural experiences of a national and international caliber are to people living in remote places or places like Kamloops, which are removed from major urban centers. As well, I grew up with the understanding that art, that the art studio is a place of work. I'm gonna share my screen with you now. 
and I've got quite a few images to go through. Um, I thought I would start uh, with a couple images of what our gallery would normally look like at opening night when I typically give a curator's tour to more than 100 people before our opening reception. Scenes that look completely surreal to us at this moment. Um, and given that I'm talking about visual art, I opted to share quite a lot of images, as I mentioned. Um, I'll go through seven exhibitions, and I apologize, I'm not going to be able to speak to each work in depth. Um, but I hope that it's uh, through the accumulation of images that you'll get a sense of some of my work. And my talk will likely take about the full 45 minutes to an hour. I'm going to focus on a few streams of my practice, weaving these topics through as I go. Uh, first, the social and political potential of art and exhibitions. Second, material strategies and conceptual underpinnings. And third, the relationship of the artist and curator as an experiment in trust. And lastly, uh, public engagement. I thought it'd be appropriate to start with a student project from 2005 that was part of my graduate thesis for UBC's curatorial program where I received my master's degree. The exhibition was called Picturing the Downtown East Side as I currently juggle multiple projects a year, looking back now at the amount of time that I had to research and develop this one exhibition over a year and the coinciding written paper, I realized what a luxury it is to be a student. Uh, to give you a bit of context here, I was living in the heart of Vancouver's downtown east side as a grad student, and I was involved in the community through a few different community art initiatives. While I was also entrenched in academia and the art scene and trying to reconcile these different worlds, traveling each day from the downtown east side through the endowment lands to the campus. In contrast to Vancouver's picturesque beauty, the downtown east side has been typified as a uniformly dangerous and alien place defined by its poverty and addiction rather than its diversity, activism and sense of community. In 2005, the markers of gentrification had taken hold in Gastown, Strathcona, Yaletown, um, and neighboring communities. But in the downtown east side, and particularly the Hastings Street corridor where this photo was taken, um, it really resisted development in part because of social housing zoning uh, restricted the redevelopment and because the drug trade was so entrenched and prolific. So legitimate capital had not triumphed. Activist efforts also held this at bay, the most politicized and publicized being the 2002 wood squat protests that involved a 92 day encampment around the entire Woodwards building slotted for development, uh, which is now home to a mixed use building, mixed use building, including Simon Fraser University's downtown campus. This site was directly across the street from the image that you see on your screens. This photo shows the facade of what was in 2005 called the Perel Building at 112 West Hastings, the historic and iconic site of numerous arts organizations, including SFU's Contemporary Art School, the Perel Gallery, the Kootenai School of Art of the Arts, Art Speak, and the Orr Gallery. The building was sitting empty when I mounted my grad show there, with the Orr Gallery closing its doors at this space in 1999. Artists and art galleries have long been an integral part of, gentr of the gentrification process in places like Soho and the East Village in Manhattan. Moving in for cheap rent and raising the appeal of rundown neighborhoods and making it more attractive to developers. In choosing to pre present my exhibition here and in a public roundtable discussion that I held on this very topic, I was asking, how are we all culpable? The exhibition was an experiment. It included 12 projects that were about or addressed the downtown east side in different ways. Community based projects were shown alongside works generated and circulated in the art world by well-known artists, including uh, Stan Douglas and Rebecca Belmore. It confronted notions of inclusive and exclusive art forms and asked who can represent who, encouraged uh, audiences from all neighborhoods in Vancouver to cross the threshold of the downtown east side, and encouraged residents of the downtown east side to visit a gallery space that might otherwise seem prohibitive. 
Um, a warning, I'm going to talk about three works now that address disturbing subject matter for about the next four slides. This is a work by Margot Lee Butler called Other Honey from 2005. Made specifically for the exhibition, this backlit video projection addresses the horrific events of missing and murdered women in the downtown east side at the time when the Picton serial murder case was in the courts and very prolific in the news. Butler is a community activist and a teacher in UBC's free humanities program in the downtown east side. She bought honey from a farm near the Picton farm where many of the bodies of the murdered women were found. In this video, she reenacts the wave of the beekeeper who sold her the honey with the overlapping text, quote, the beekeeper has honey from bees who pollinate flowers there, end quote. The placement of this video facing the street for those on the street intentionally transcends the invisible dividing line of the space of the gallery and the street and those audiences. Something that I've thought a lot about in recent outdoor video projection projects that I've organized and we'll talk about later. Inside at the very end of the gallery was Rebecca Belmore's uh, video installation, The Named and the Unnamed from 2002. Rebecca Belmore, as you likely know, is an internationally recognized multidisciplinary artist whose work is rooted in the political and social realities of indig indigenous communities. Her work makes evocative connections between bodies, land, and language. This installation features the performance Vigil, in which Belmore writes the names of missing and murdered women on her arms. She nails her red dress to posts and stretches the material with her body weight as she draws roses with their thorns through her lips and scrubs the street with water. While the performance took place in the downtown east side, this was the first time the video had been shown in the neighborhood. This is a project led by Rita Beeks called She Counts from 1997. Um, it's a collaborative, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a closer up um, images here. Uh, you'll notice that the it's very much student photography with these images. <laughs> Um, it was a collaborative project with women who had used the services at the Downtown East Side Women's Center. <clears throat> they were given disposable cameras to document, document their own lives and given the opportunity to make decisions about how the images were shown to the public. The text next to the photos that you can't quite make out here um, convey the women's responses to viewing their photographs and their experience of the project uh, itself. Many of the women had very little access to cameras and the images are essentially the kind of snapshots that anyone might have in their family album showing their everyday lives. The project was previously shown in bus, bus stop shelters on posters and street banners conveying the message that the life of every woman matters. This was the first time the installation was shown in the downtown east side as well. Um, and sadly, many of the women who were involved in the project had gone missing at the time of the show. Um, not all the works in the exhibition address the missing and murdered women, of course, but uh, these works I thought were good examples of bringing up key questions about who can represent these kinds of issues and how to address them and about the audiences who consume them. I'm going to go more quickly now through the rest of the show. Um, this was a work by Susan Stewart that uh, dealt with surveillance in the neighborhood. And this was the first image that you'd see on entering the gallery. You could also see it from the windows outside. And it was um, spray printed directly on the wall um, by a, a street artist who I'd worked with in the neighborhood. And um, you can see Des Media's uh, collaborative mural paintings and video there. Um, that was uh, a collective that uh, was started by Jay Saloom. And um, folks were asked to come in and record with them. We had ongoing workshops during the exhibition. And um, the, this is documentation of some, um, a chalk project that was done in front of, um, of the Carnegie Hall at Maine and Hastings, um, where people were, were given chalk to write or draw whatever they wanted. And um, this was an, 
uh, work that came out of an exhibition at Artspeak um, with um, Arnie Haraldson documenting um, different buildings. There's the Carnegie Center there um, in the downtown east side and a postcard project by Clint Burnham. And uh, again, I wish I really had a better, better images of this to show you, but um, these are works by Stan Douglas. Um, this, uh, these photographs are called Every Building on 100 West Hastings Street from 2001, um, featuring vacant buildings on the entire block where the exhibition was located in a filmic representation that points to the omnipresence of the Hollywood North film industry in the area at, at that time with a stark absence of people in the photographs. The inclusion of this work asked how we read this geography differently when actively present in it. How do we read it differently in the context of the other works in the show? So you'll see here it's paired with um, a painting by um, um, a local artist who lived in one of the SROs down the street. And this is his version of the downtown east side. I'm gonna jump ahead in time now to the first exhibition that I organized at the Kamloops Art Gallery, uh, which came out of my own research and curatorial propositions a year after I began my position as curator here. Um, this image shows a permanent sculpture by Cameron Kerr memorializing the 2003 wildfires with um, a CAG banner in the background. Um, just to situate us a bit, for those of you who don't know Kamloops, it's a city of about 85,000 people about four hours drive from Vancouver, which is the closest major urban center. The gallery was purpose built in its downtown location in 1998 with a shared civic building that houses the Thompson River uh, Regional District offices and the library. Coming from the context of Vancouver, where I generally found art viewers to be a cohesive group of artists, curators and academics, all speaking the same art language, Audiences for the CAGS exhibitions come from a hugely diverse educational, professional, and economic background. Given its relatively remote location, the CAG has a strong reputation for its rigorous work in the field, including its crowning achievement in 2005 when the CAG co-commissioned with the Morris and Helen Belkin Art Gallery Canada's participation in the 51st Venice Biennale with uh, the work of Rebecca Belmore. Um, while we have this strong national reputation, our contemporary exhibitions, particularly those with political content, are welcomed by some and uh, certainly a challenge for others. And um, I thought uh, we could talk more about that if you have, have questions about how we engage our wide range of audiences during the questions later. So this is the facade of the Kamloops Art Gallery in 2012. Uh, an era of discontent, art as occupation, ran from October to December that year. It emerged as a response to the Occupy movements and Arab Spring revolutions that began in 2010-11, just over 10 years ago now. Uh, my interest in this topic was similar to my grad show, driven by a question about the relationship between art and politics and the role of art and artists in a time of heightened political consciousness. But unlike the focused context of picturing the downtown east side, the framework here was more open, offering a broad range of artistic approaches by a diverse group of artists, about 12 projects, many collaborative, to the topics of protest, social morality, and power. The exhibition asks what it means to occupy physical and ideological space. Projects address subjects including cultural capital, labor, war, nationhood, and mass resistance within the context of systems of power. Holly Ward's Persistence of Vision from 2011 was initially created for Artspeak in Vancouver's downtown east side, another link here to my earlier work. Um, this was the only work in the show that addressed the Arab Spring Revolution specifically. She draws a relationship between the development of the utopian imaginary and the Arab Spring uprisings with a rescaled version of the 100 meter tall monument in Pearl Square in Bahrain, which was erected to commemorate the Gulf Corporation Council's Six Nations and the pearl industry, the main economic resource before oil brought wealth to the region. 
The monument was appropriated by freedom and democracy movements in 2011 and Pearl Square became the focal point for ongoing and violent clashes. In March, the government ironically demolished its own symbol of power in an effort to take control of the area now occupied by a tent city in protests. In place of the Pearl, Ward's unmonumental sculpture beholds a crystal ball suggestively looking to the future and reflecting the posters on the wall carrying evocative titles taken from the influential philosopher Ernst Bloch's three volume treaties, The Principle of Hope. They were published in 1954, 1955, and 1959. Um, and, and these um, slogans were taken up by activists in the May 1968 protests, suggesting the persistence and relevance of his ideas. The diagrammatic floor design refers to utopian city designs and the poster project on the exterior of the gallery shown in the previous slide also installed throughout public spaces in downtown Kamloops, comment on publicness and the effects of urban planning on the people. I apologize again, I'm just gonna kind of briefly go through the some installation shots of the show to give you a sense of things, but won't focus on too many works. You can see May uh, 68 coming up again in Elizabeth Sponar's work. Um, so you'll see some examples here of my interest, including, including cultural objects that are not typically shown in an art gallery or considered art objects. Um, a chainsaw carving there of Karl Marx's head and accompanying video projection by the artist Cameron Kerr is uh, shows him in the video cutting down the tree for this project in a, a clear cut. Um, and that's a chainsaw carving he made specifically for the show. Um, you'll also see a teapot with a hand in a fist at the top by Turkish ceramicist Ekrem Yaziki. And these were five war rugs made in Afghanistan, where following the 1979 Soviet invasion, Afghani rug makers started incorporating war iconography like grenades, tanks, rocket launchers, and fighter planes, and recollections of events like 9-11 into their rugs, replacing decorative motifs perhaps as a way for women in particular who were predominantly the rug makers to make their experiences visible to the rest of the world. Research into these rugs came from attending Documenta 13 back when I was able to travel internationally for curatorial research. I had seen a work entitled uh, Mappa from 1969 by the Italian conceptual artist Alerjo Boetti, which was an embroidered world map with each country represented by the patterns of its national flag as if that were its essential identity. Boetti had commissioned local artisans to produce embroideries during the 1970s. And what became known as the Boetti style began to appear throughout Afghanistan, Afghanistan and Pakistan. So when I came across these rugs, I found the connection quite fascinating. This is a work from our collection by Teresa Marshall. You'll notice uh, the reoccurrence of posters and flags throughout the exhibition, a common form of resistance and assertion of power. This is the earliest work from 1969, a, a text-based work. Um, I also had the opportunity to attend the Berlin Biennale that year and came across a powerful project initiated by Jonas Stahl and Yunus Buadi called the New World Summit. The New World Summit is an artistic and political organization that develops parliaments with and for stateless states, autonomous groups, and blacklisted political organizations. The keg reproduced the flags and a banner I had seen in their Berlin installation, which were originally part of a theater set resembling an alternate UN. 
where the uh, presentations shown in the video were held. You can see uh, the image of it there. The New World Summit is an alternative parliament for political and legal representatives of organizations currently placed on international terror, terrorist lists, those considered to pose a threat to international security. At the time in the European Union, a secret committee, the so-called Clearinghouse, would compile a terrorist list of organizations who are consequently banned from international travel and whose bank accounts are then frozen. Some on this list include the National Democratic Front of the Philippines, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Alam or the Tamil Tigers, and the Kurdish Women's Movement. The New World Summit project raises questions about who's able to mobilize and who makes decisions about appropriate and illegal activism. They attempt to use art to create a space for radical diplomacy as a non-exclusive political platform for marginalized voices, blur blurring the lines between art and social practice. I wanted to show you a couple examples here of the kind of public space that we often cre create in an exhibition uh, where I work closely with Emily Hope, our education and public programs director to offer additional resources or space for visitors to respond to the exhibition. And these are uh, typically very well used. As you can see, we had to um, um, erase this a couple times to give more people a chance to draw and, and write what they wanted. I am going to switch gears pretty drastically here now <laughs> uh, to another stream of my cur curatorial practice. Uh, the connection between ideas and materiality. My exhibitions come from ongoing research in the field and observations of similar artistic approaches that surface in consistent ways. Ideas and Things from 2015 looked at material and conceptually based artistic practices where objects were no longer privileged but in integrated into a greater exploration of space, time, and material. The exhibition brought together the work of five uh, Canadian artists whose practices shared a strong research methodology and diverse approaches to materiality through the investigation of subjects such as color theory, text, intervention into the conventions of gallery display and viewership, uh, integration of the everyday object, cinematic history and performance. It included work by Jen Aiken, Kelly Lichen, Hadley and Maxwell, Mark Newfeld, and Derek Sub Sullivan. Traditional display method methods, such as the vitrine and plinth were no longer relevant. In some cases, the pedestal and the wall were, were the work. In a double agency where form and content merged, the architectural space of the exhibition became the exhibition. Their works questioned the monument and the monumental and offered a new currency of ideas about things. Uh, we're looking at a work by Mark Newfeld here. He's an artist based in Winnipeg where he currently teaches at the University of Manitoba School of Art. And some of you may remember him. He graduated from UVic with his MFA in 2005. Although Newfeld works with a variety of media, painting is a starting point for his activities. For a Neufeld, painting belongs to a network of forms and ideas that exist in the social realm. Neufeld's May 8, 1906, a film adrift in the cosmos was conceived as an embodied film realized as multiple non-cinematic objects involving research into local Kamloops histories and an interest in the vernacular of the Western. May 8th, 1906 alludes to the date of the infamous Bill Minor train robbery in this region, and the text is derived from filmmaker Jean-Luc Godard's film Weekend, in which a title card repeatedly interrupts the scene with the words, a film adrift in the cosmos. With these moments of text interspersed throughout Newfield's installation, he sets up a counter rhythm to the paintings on the wall. Newfield brings together a number of disparate objects that are not meant to be read as discrete objects, but rather as a fluid interplay of signs. This includes a series of small oil 
on canvas paintings, found objects, a reprinted newspaper from the day of the 1906 train robbery, two bronze sculptures by the well-known cowboy artist Frederick Remington, and a choreographed, mostly, si mostly silent performance by a local actor that occurs once a week, or occurred once a week. Uh, the actor was modeled after the gentleman robber character Bill Miner, who it could be argued modeled himself after the villain in the 1903 silent Western film, The Great Train Robbery. The performer's script was based on two performances from the 1960s from the American artist Bruce Nauman uh, called Walking in an Exaggerated Manner Around the Perimeter of a Square and Dance or Exercise on the Perimeter of a Square. When the performance was not happening, the installation existed as a, a film set or a stage awaiting action. <clears throat> this is a work by Jen Aiken that was just around the corner from Mark's work, uh, including soft sculpture and drawing. Uh, I think I can show you a little soft sculpture hidden tucked into the architecture there. Right there. Another one there. And she also drew on the wall. And this was a work by Derek Sullivan that uh, required our team to build the wall called the turn of 90 degrees is the most that one can change direction without backtracking. So um, really interrupted the flow of viewers in the space. Um, and you'll see from his, uh, his titles that he, uh, the titles would change with every exhibition. Uh, so he would send us the posters and, and we would install them on our made up wall. And this was a, a wall sculpture installation by Hadley and Maxwell made out of cinefoil typically used in, in theater. Um, I wanted to focus on, on this work um, by Kelly Lichen called More Than Anything. Um, Lichen's photo-based practice uh, and installation practice examines how the value of objects is contingent upon the conditions of display and how value shifts through the process of exchange, repurposing, and recontextualization. So this work uh, specifically made for the space of the gallery became part of the architecture so that the gallery was no longer a backdrop for display. Drywall that is normally made visible through layers of mud and paint was revealed in its natural state on the floor, on the walls and in stacks. The collection of leaning cutout mantel pieces there Uh, reflects uh, homogenization of domestic space, each painted in a different shade of Martha Stewart white paint. Each cutout contains unique features traced from objects found on mantles in individual homes. Kelly Lichen's stack in the gallery flattened and conflated distinctions between home decor, the working space of the studio, and the display space of the gallery. And I focused on those, the, um, those two works in the show as kind of a segue into uh, the way that I work with artists as an experiment in trust. That was key to our 2018 exhibition, Eleanor King, Inverted Pyramids and Roads to Nowhere. Eleanor King is a Nova Scotia Nova Scotia artist based in Brooklyn, New York, and her practice combines sound art installation, social practice, improvisation, drawing and sculptural installations that engage with memory, community, technology, and the everyday. Um, also a musician, sound is often integrated into the spatial experiences of her found and self-generated sculptural installations and relational aesthetics. Frequently site-specific King's installations emerge from research that addresses the place and context where she's exhibiting. In response to my initial contact about a potential solo exhibition at the gallery, King replied, quote, because I often work site-specifically, I absolutely rely on positive relationships with trusting and adventurous curators like yourself, as my exhibitions are rarely a one-size-all-fits approach. 
uh, I always welcome the space to make new work, end quote. Through massive abstracted landscapes and text-based wall paintings painted directly on the walls of the gallery by King over successive days and nights, her work pointed to the collusion with corporations like Google and their pervasive user-friendly version of military mapping tools. King's wall paintings and videos use Google Maps to follow waterways telling a story of this region's resource-based economy. So logging roads and, and mining pits. In the new work made for this exhibition, King intervened with the architecture of the gallery, shifting walls into new configurations that fold inside and outside spaces into one another, filling awkward architectural nooks with salvaged materials, the, fire, the firewood that you saw, and creating a sensory experience of sight and sound. This was a immersive video installation behind those walls. A soundtrack played throughout the gallery with a recording of a song shown in the previous slide, uh, the vinyl text that was on the wall written by King and sung by the Kamloops Thompson Honor Choir, who we see here performing at the opening reception, conveying a message of urgency by youth about the future of the planet. I, I won't attempt to sing it for you, but here's a sample of the lyrics. We know it's not a good idea taking from our future selves short-term gain for long-term pain. Don't say, don't say, don't say you didn't know it was coming. Um, I also just wanted to show this, this book, a uh, monograph that we recently published in partnership with the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia with text by Sarah Fillmore, Amy Fung, and myself in an interview with Eleanor and uh, Marie Gerge. Um, we publish about one to two books a year in conjunction with our exhibitions. And this was a labor of love. Switching gears now, um, the last two exhibitions I'll discuss um, are Luminosity, uh, exhibitions that focus on one of the central overarching aims of my work, public engagement. Um, again, I, I wish I had time to speak to each project, um, but I wanna make sure we have time for questions. Um, so I'm gonna flip through a number of images just to give you a flavor of our first luminosity. Inspired by public art events like Nuit Blanche, Luminosity was an idea brought forward by local artists and was percolating at the gallery for some time. Um, and I was finally able to realize it in 2014. Luminosity is a free week long public art project organized by the Kamloops Art Gallery featuring video projection, new media works and events in public spaces throughout downtown Kamloops. Um, so we present it every two years now, so it's a Biennale. The goal of this offsite initiative is to enliven public spaces in unexpected ways, to embrace new creative concepts and modes of expression in the media arts field and encourage diverse audience engagement outside the gallery's regular programming. It typically includes over 20 artists and multiple sites with weekend performances by bands and DJs. Um, and we found that this crossover of audiences who come to see a band and then encounter video art as part of this uh, success. Of course, Luminosity 2020 this past fall couldn't include live performance. Um, we usually, as you saw in the earlier photos, we usually take over the inside of the rotary band shell in Riverside Park and host um, sound performances, artist talks, music performances with a bar in the evenings. And it's usually really packed. It's a space that's been converted that's not actually meant for um, public gathering, but we create a, a kind of club out of it. Uh, in 2014, Instant Coffee transformed the space into pink noise with their light bar and a lineup of local and non-local bands and DJs. Student and faculty projects from the Thompson River University Visual Arts Department are often included, as well as new work commissioned for the exhibition. Um, just skip past um, Conley's shunt 
project uh, that he created here and showing the landscape of, of Kamloops and trains shunting, um, as well as uh, Stephanie Patsula's work in the window of the Kamloops Museum and archives coming up here in the slides. Luminosity is about community involvement, engaging in of the city in a new way, and an attempt to take away the invisible barrier of the gallery wall and to provide inroads to contemporary art. Uh, this community focus is emboldened by partnerships with other organizations like the Kamloops Museum and Archives that you see the window of here, the city of Kamloops and local businesses. While speaking to broad publics, I've always maintained a commitment to curatorial rigor over spectacle with luminosity. This is Luminosity 2020 that uh, we were able to go ahead with just before um, the provincial um, restrictions came in, luckily. Um, so this final group of slides I'm gonna talk about returns to my interest in creating exhibitions that support artist projects rooted in the political and social. For uh, Luminosity 2020, I invited Zoe Chan to co-curate the exhibition to expand my curatorial voice. Zoe Chan is assistant curator at the, Cam or the, at the Vancouver Art Gallery and an independent curator living in Vancouver. Her curatorial projects have delved into a range of subject matters, including youth, diasporic identities, food, and discourse around representation in art and visual culture with a strong focus on video projection. The world had drastically changed since the Kamloops Art Gallery presented Luminosity in 2018. The 2020 exhibition program responded to our current unprecedented moment in history where the world is collectively experiencing a pandemic with its effect of death and loss and isolation and the upheaval, upheaval of economic and political systems and mass uprisings against police brutality and white supremacy amidst the ongoing climate crisis. Projects touched on themes of power and resistance, strength and fragility, public and private connection and isolation. Participating artists imparted diverse experiences through projects that provided insight into histories and futures. So this is Riverside Park where a majority of the projects take place just down uh, by the river. Oh, and I have to point uh, this work out by Levi Glass called Cinerama, uh, which glowed with eight backlit projections in the middle of Riverside Park um, and that you could enter for a, an immersive experience. Uh, Levi Glass was a graduate of the Thompson Rivers University Visual Arts Program. And more recently, some of you may know an MFA graduate from UBIC. Uh, and we offered two curator tours, one of which uh, Zoe could join me for um, a snowy first night. It was the first night we'd ever had snow for luminosity um, in October. And then we also offered nightly tours in the park. So uh, I wanted to highlight two final works. This is Dislocation Blues from 2017 by Sky Hopunka, uh, who is a Ho-Chunk Nation Pachanga band of Lueso with a uh, Luciano Indian, uh, an artist currently teaching at SFU. The inclusion of Sky Hopunka's work uh, reflected the exhibition's exploration of power and resistance as an acknowledgement of the Canadian context of the Wet'suwet'en protests opposing resource extraction on indigenous land. Dislocation Blues offers a view into the grassroots Dakota access pipeline protests. Uh, these protests, as you may know, began in early 2016 in reaction to the approved construction of Dakota access pipeline in the Northern United States. The pipeline was projected to run under part of the 
of Lake Oha uh, near the Standing Rock Indian Reservation. Many in the Standing Rock tribe and surrounding communities consider the pipeline to constitute a serious threat to the region's water. The construction is also seen as a direct threat to ancient burial grounds and cultural sites of historic importance. So hoping because um, he characterizes his video as an quote, incomplete and imperfect portrait of reflections from Standing Rock. Um, the central character Cleo Kina recounts his experiences entering, being at and leaving the camp and the difficulties and reluctance and looking back with a clear and critical eye. Terry Running Wild describes, quote, what his camp is like and what he hopes it will become, end quote. In the context of an overabundance of cameras documenting the people, actions, and violence of this place and time, Hopinka's video attempts to tell stories that are multidimensional and complicated, uh, providing a critical lens during a time of fake news and false truth. His video offers space to question how we remember collectively and as individuals. And his work speaks to larger subjectivities at play during such a public and historic event. And he reflected, quote, finding others that are just as alone as you makes navigating the longitudes and latitudes of post-colonial America that much easier to bear, end quote. I'm going to end with um, Sandeep Joe Hall's animation for Joe T, uh, which spoke to the curatorial focus on themes of power and resistance and strength and fragility. For Joe T was originally made for the Facade Festival in Vancouver in 2019, where it was projected uh, on the facade of the Vancouver Art Gallery. An extension of Joe Hall's body of work, Rest in Power. It tells the story of Jyoti Singh, a young woman whose attack and subsequent death in 2012 united India in heated protests and debate around women's rights and gender equality. Employing her signature graphic style through her collaborative animation project, Johal uses color and symbolism to represent this tragic event. The work communicates an empowering, uplifting message that honors not only Jyoti Singh, but survivors of gendered violence everywhere. And I thought I would end my talk on this hopeful image of the next generation of art viewers. Thank you for your attention. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Thank you so much. Uh, if you have any questions, all you need to do is type the word question in chat and I will call on you to unmute yourself and ask that question. Usually it takes, oh, it doesn't take a couple minutes. <laughs> uh, Megan, go ahead. I was ready for you this time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tara. I was curious, you talked about um, diverse audiences and how to approach that and how different it was from Vancouver to where you are now. And something maybe as artists we should consider, our, I mean, we should totally consider our audiences, but sort of what you, how would you go about thinking about different audiences and how to, I don't know, contact or talk to them? That'd be great. Yeah, um, I guess it, it keeps me going here, really. Because... I think you touched on it with those for sure, yeah. <laughs> like the ones you yeah. showed us, I was just interested. But um, I, I mean, everything that we do is for the public. We're a public art gallery. And so, um, you know, I've been reflecting on it a lot with COVID because um, we had to close for three months. And just to think about um, our, do we exist if we don't have the public to come and see the exhibitions? It was, it was uh, like, I felt like I was standing on my head or something. Um, it really turned me around. Um, so yeah, it's essential. And, but I don't know that we can know who we're speaking to at all times. So we have to assume that we're speaking to people who are coming here from many different backgrounds and different perspectives. And um, like I said, I, I think, um, you know, I. 
you probably all agree these are, these are pretty heady exhibitions and so um, we have such a great team and I mentioned Emily Hope, um, we work really closely together to figure out ways um, to engage young people, um, like, you know, the kids from daycare <laughs> um, who come still and uh, youth and, uh, but you know, like youth is a large age span, um, seniors, um, sort of art literate people, um, people who, who are just passing through Kamloops, like we have to imagine ways for them to engage in, you know, what, what's the hook like, right. you know, uh, so, so part of that is, is definitely thinking about um, the, the extra things that we can offer. Like we have um, exhibition tours on an iPad. So if somebody wanted to, they could go through and have it all explained to them. We have very lengthy didactics. Um, and then we have these resource rooms usually where you can sit and read more about uh, the artist practice or things that they're interested in or things that relate to the theme of the show or like an activity, like you can go take a piece of paper and draw some an artwork in the show. Um, Just various approaches. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. I just hadn't really considered, I mean, it makes sense. We're in this art world right now. So of course we're sort of all talking that, but it's important to consider. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Uh, up next, we have a question from Bonnie. Hi there. Um, you mentioned uh, earlier that, uh, you know, you tend to um, focus on, you know, political and social subject matter for exhibitions, but I was wondering, when you're looking at, you know, various works or various artists, what is it that jumps out at you and inspires you and catches your attention and, you know, says to you, this is the, the work, this is the artist that I want to, you know, show to others? That's a really good question. I love your image, your Kermit the Frog image. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't think it's one thing. I, I don't have a um, one answer for that either, but um, it's, you know, I'm on doing ongoing research in the field. So, um, uh, you know, I mentioned with ideas and things, I, I was thinking about these, these group shows. Um, certainly, like, there are, th there are, I don't want to call it trends, but there are things that are emerge during a given time that you you have to notice, you know, why are artists interested in talking about thing theory right now? So, um, you know, those things catch my attention when I when I see a more than one artist um, thinking about the same ideas. Um, but you know, back to the publics too. Like my consideration for so I usually curate about or organize about four exhibitions in a year. Um, but I don't, those aren't all my projects. So uh, probably one to two of them will be projects that I've researched and, and generated um, on my own. Otherwise, we, we also take uh, touring exhibitions or I have guest curators come. Um, and all that to say that I try to create a balance. So I look at a, a year and I think about, um, do we have a, a group show? Do we have um, good representation from women, what, um, um, and men, you know, like the, that there's something that speaks to, um, what's going on right now in art in, in every exhibition. And that hopefully comes, you know, is, is different enough that, um, that you'll come to a given show here and you'll, even though you're in Kamloops, you'll, you'll have a sense of what's what's going on what are the dialogues across the country right now in art so i yeah i think it's just it comes out of my ongoing research did that answer answer your question yes i think so thank you very much <laughs> uh who are uh, liam go ahead hello 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 hi um, 
I'm fascinated by this idea about um, ideas and uh, materiality and the connection between those two things. And I've been, you know, kind of engaging a little bit half-facedly with um, Graham Harmon's idea of object-oriented ontologies. And yeah. I was wondering if like a gallery is kind of like this, this teaching arena, you know, in some ways, you know, like kind of like uh, engaged with education in, in, in large part. And if, if in your experience with these, uh, this, the show about ideas and materiality, if you've discovered any sort of um, anything that the gallery could learn from this idea of an object oriented ontology or a more material based way of, of being and where that like object oriented ontologies could could sort of like lead into sort of educational systems and any, any sort of connection there. Very open ended question, but if you have any insight there, I'd love to hear about it. Well, it's funny that you bring it up because um, in 2019, we had a show of Samuel Roy Bois work and um, he turned me on to uh, that book and um, yeah, I think uh, thing theory is, is just, it's flying around still. So, um, you know, like the, just the questioning about what are things, what are objects, how do they, how, how does something that's made in a studio change when it enters the gallery space? Um, I, I find that a lot of artists are questioning that right now. Um, and, and I think that that's really what um, drove that exhibition. Um, certainly, yeah, there's lots of educational avenues there. Um, I, I would say like one thing that I was after in thinking about that too was um, demonstrating, especially to young art students here, the, the research practice behind uh, a lot of artistic practices. Um, and you know, not every artist works that way, but, um, you know, there's a real difference now between the kind of modernist um, idea of um, an artist just working within one medium, right? Um, so uh, that's why I wanted to highlight um, Mark's work because he's a painter, but he's also dealing with the objects in the world. Um, so I hope that like all of that becomes educational. I mean, I, I, I see it all that way. No, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, even, even if, it, if um, sort of looking at objects in this way sort of um, creates an understanding of the potential of them. You mm -hmm. know, I think that's, that's a fantastic way to approach all education, you know. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> We have any further quote? Colton's hopping in. Go ahead, Colton. Hey, um, I think this would tie in a bit to your uh, first question, um, Sam, but maybe more specifically, I'm interested in like being in not northern BC, but I feel like anywhere north of Vancouver is like north in relation to politics. Um, and with the show, um, by Eleanor King um, that was, you know, more interrogative of like resource extraction industries. Did you, like, how was the public response with that? Like, I imagine, um, I imagine Kamloops has a lot more like resource extraction stuff like logging around. And I don't know if that's anything that you guys are like wary of, of getting any kind of pushback or if there's any worry about like funding being connected to not being like too political about like local issues. Um, no, we can't live in fear. <laughs> uh, we're, we're here to um, progress ideas and thinking around art and the world. Um, and I, I would say um, probably there was some criticism. We don't always hear it, right? Mm -hmm. We get the people who come in and um, take the time with the exhibitions. Um, and um, I, I would also say that like her work wasn't implicitly critical and she, she really talked about that a lot. Um, it was an exploration um, also of her implicit um, contribution to 
um, her, her environmental impact. And she talked a lot about that just in travel. Um, and so, uh, you know, in working with the youth and then repurposing a lot of the objects that were in the exhibition, that piano now lives in my house. <laughs> um, you know, she, she also had a, a few days where she asked people to come and take the firewood away to um, warm their homes. Mm. Um, and she didn't want to ship anything here. So she just made do with what we had and made the work here. So it was really her travel. So all of that, um, I think by, um, you know, thinking about herself is also culpable. Um, it made it more complicated and more interesting, I think, the work, but also um, it wasn't pointed like mining's bad, um, logging's bad. Um, that would be very simplistic. Um, so maybe pe people read it that way, but um, I think it, it was um, uh, more, more a, a broad criticism and, and thinking about futures. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that makes sense. I think it's really important to be like, um, yeah, aware of the complexity and aware of our own relationships. But I just like, I don't know, and, and I'm interested in exhibiting places in rural places as well with like these kind of issues. Um, mm -hmm. But I just feel like it's so easy to, for people really entrenched in that to write it off like anything that seems like it's the counter side or the other side, just being like, oh, that place is just, you know, whatever. But anyway, it's good that people are able to engage with that there. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Colton. Uh, Connor, you have a question. Um, you've mentioned a few times kind of uh, your research in the field. And, you know, I, I'd be curious just to hear what that looks like um, kind of in, in the normal world and then uh, maybe what that looks like now. Um, kind of into COVID times and kind of how you think that's going to be going in the future. Yeah, I, I've been thinking about that a lot um, with the COVID times because it made me realize um, my isolation here even more. So um, I used to do a lot more travel to see exhibitions and to do studio visits. Um, but it also made me realize how much because we're um, fairly removed from urban places, um, urban centers, that a lot of the time I, I use video chats to do studio visits already. Like I, before Zoom came along, I was Skype, um, or I would, um, a lot of communication by email, a lot of phone calls, um, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so I miss seeing exhibitions. Um, that's huge for me and just meeting with colleagues and talking and, um, but I would say there's so much great online content that I, I feel like I can dip in to that. Um, yeah, so, I, you know, I, I read a lot of art magazines. <laughs> I flag a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, um, there's just so much good work going on out there that uh, provides research for me. Yeah. Great. That's great. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? We've got time. I have a, I have a question. <laughs> I didn't type it in. Sorry, Jordan. That's um, all right. It's about um, timelines. Like, how far in advance? you program uh you speak a little bit you spoke a little bit about responding to zeitgeists from things that are kind of coming up um and when more than one artists are dealing with them and you do a lot of socio uh political programming um and i'm wondering with some of those kinds of issues that are happening in the present you know if you have to program three years in advance how do you respond to that in a kind of timely manner um I say that um, even though like looking at some of the artists that you presented, they seem very timeless, you know, like the mm -hmm. work by Sky uh, Hapinka, you know, I, it makes me think of the protests going on here to save the Carmana wall brand. So there's something that we can kind of build on that energy of uh, protest and rebellion, certainly. But I'm wondering what it's like for you as a, a curator, like having that disconnect of time of like, 
you know, really wanting to respond to something, but then having to wait maybe three years before you can. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Um, we, like every other public art gallery, we um, are driven by our grant writing schedule. So yeah, it's three or four years in advance. Um, so we develop a lot of content in doing that and, and a plan that's more than a sketch. Um, but it can be changeable too. Um, so I do feel like I have the room to be somewhat responsive and things fall through and then other things happen. Um, and hopefully the artists that I'm thinking about um, matter within a decade span, right? <laughs> that they don't become irrelevant. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, the, the timeline shortened a lot with COVID because we've had to make lots of adjustments um, and that's uh, been stressful, but also benefited us. So luminosity that came together very quickly. Um, I wasn't sure that we could do it and we just decided to do it. <laughs> and it and it happened so we just shifted the way that we did it but um yeah that would that timeline was a lot quicker th but it came together um yeah so you, so you can you can do it um yeah there's some certain things like i think about projects a couple of years off and i and i don't feel like they're not going to be interesting or relevant uh, I think that we can still work within a three to four year time frame. Yeah. Thank you. One last call. I'm doing it now. Uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to just type the word question and you can ask that. <laughs> I just want to say, I think uh, Cedric is still on here, but we, there is, he has a Mark Neufeld painting in his office. And I think it, he said it's one of the last ones from that body of work because um, the rest of that work didn't survive. So I, I just thought that was really interesting that we get to live with that work. <laughs> um, yeah, I was actually showing um, that painting to Alana um, today. Uh, I believe it is the last piece from that uh, whole exhibition that survives because it all was destroyed when a studio burned in Winnipeg a few years ago. And I've been texting with Graham about it because he was in that studio too. So there's a lot of connections. <laughs> I don't know if it's a thumbs up you need, Graham. It's kind of <laughs> that one, right? Oh. So seeing that show i saw his i saw that show in winnipeg and then seeing the documentation of it uh in kamloops it's kind of uh it's kind of heartbreaking uh it's an amazing show or like a really really uh beautiful body of work that one and to think of it not being there anymore is kind of like kind of breaks the heart yeah. So I, unless there's any further questions, um, thank you, Chara. That's you've given us lots to think about and consider, and thank you for sharing um, insights into your process. Thank and you all. Look forward to seeing the students tomorrow. Um, everyone, you're welcome to unmute yourselves and um, give Charo an applause. I know it's one of those things that we would normally do in person, and there's, there's a bit of a disconnect when it's <laughs> but thank you very much.